Here she is, Helen Faulkner, telling us something about Debian in um, Skyens uh, research. Hi, I think it's uh, quite easy to tell that this is the last session <laughs> and that half the conference has already left, but that's life. And uh, I'm really enjoying my new email address for anyone who hasn't figured that out. And I might almost be tempted to go and hug Elmo again, except that <laughs> I'm scared that he'd take it away from me. So, uh, so maybe I won't. You know, you can use the logo with the bottle now that you're one of us. I, you're right, I could do. Now, how do you work this? Ah, magic. Okay, so about me. I'm, I'm a physicist. Um, I do academic research. I'm at the beginning of my career, hopefully to be a, a shining one. Um, and mostly I do optics, mostly theory, um, mostly focusing on electron microscopy, which is uh, entertaining and useful sometimes. Um, and mo most of my work is theoretical, but I've done a bit of experiment uh, in the last few years when I was living in the UK. And my research is, you know, to put it as simply as you can, it's about seeing small things, looking inside really, really small things like crystals or pro uh, proteins and seeing what the chemical structure of those is. And I just love this cartoon. How many people here are involved in science? Anyone? A few of you. Oh, that's great, because I was really, really hoping that Lots of the people who showed up would be people who have opinions about this stuff. I've used Debian for a few years now since I gave way to my housemate's urgings and said, all right, will you shut up if I let you install it? And, you know, he did and um, the rest is history. I got um, much more heavily involved with Debian about a year ago, um, thanks to the Debian Women Project and the uh, early controversy which surrounded it. Um, and mostly I use Debian for my research. I think that's what I mostly use the computer for. That and IRC, of course. Um, and I'm really interested in making Debian uh, more, more useful, um, easier to use for science research because I think it's such a great <coughs> operating system um, with such potential for science. And one of the reasons is that um, there's, there's a really clear match in philosophy, in my opinion, between science and free software. Um, scientists, research scientists, we're used to collaborating with people to achieve a common, sometimes a very far off goal. Um, we're absolutely used to building on the, the, the work that um, people have done before us. It's often extremely incremental. Um, we're used to sharing our work so that other people can build from it. And we're used to uh, making judgments about each other and ourselves based on the quality of the work that we do and to knowing that, that our, um, our success is, is very uh, strongly connected to our reputation as, as a good scientist or as a bad scientist. And I mean, everything depends on that funding, you know, getting a job, um, being able to do the research that you want to do depends on having a good reputation. And I think that's, that's uh, not unlike the um, free and open source software community. Um, so scientists really already understand very well and agree with the philosophy of the open source movement. Um, if we didn't agree with it, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. And I think that that means that Linux is a very natural choice for scientists to use um, in, in the uh, computer work that we do. And of course Debian is the best distribution out there. Uh, so the question is, why don't all scientists use Debian? Um, I'm not going to tell you, actually. I want you to tell me. But here's what I think. Um, what do scientists want out of an operating system? Well, I wrote down the stuff. That's not all showing, is it? Oh, that's bad. Can you scroll? Hmm. You can tell us with the live button. Well, I can't see it here. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Yes, but there's at least one other point. That's a problem. Okay, we have a problem <laughs> with the, uh, possibly with the difference in resolution between this screen and my screen. Sorry about that. Yeah. All right, so I'll be guessing the bottom point on every slide from here on, but, but we can deal with that. Um, 
Okay, so I sat down and thought, well, what do I want as a, as a scientist? Um, and the first thing that I need for my work, which is mainly theoretical, is a coding environment and compilers for the languages that I'm using. And I know that lots of people might laugh at me for admitting it, but I grew up writing physics code in Fortran. And there's a whole lot of people still doing that because there's such a wealth of um, numerical libraries for Fortran and it's fast and it's easy. Um, and then I, I've since coded in C++ mainly because I thought it would be entertaining to switch without having any idea of how difficult that would be. But that's, that's a few years past and I've, I've sort of got, gotten my head around it. Um, the other language that uh, the people that I've worked with have used extensively is MATLAB. Um, and again, because it's so easy, it's high level. You don't have to think about the, the grotty details. And I mostly don't want to know about the grotty details. Um, the next most important thing that I need is graphing programs uh, which will handle really large da data sets, which I collect with my research, and uh, produce plots that I can whack into papers easily without mucking around for hours and hours. Um, I want access to high-level languages or scripting languages or um, you know, things within the graphing programs that allow me to do uh, sophisticated or interesting um, analyses of my data so I can pull out the information that's in it, get the results that, um, that are in there. And of course, I need to use LaTeX or sometimes word processors. Um, in physics anyway, there are some journals which will only accept uh, Microsoft Word documents as paper submissions. So mostly I use LaTeX when I can, but I can't always. Um, so we need this stuff for writing papers. Um, and for writing talks, I usually use OpenOffice, but um, you need some sort of presentation. Yeah? Oh, I have a question. Is, um, I, I often hear it asserted that, oh, sorry, I often hear it asserted that OpenOffice, it's not on? It says it's on. Oh, there we go. It was just the levels. I often hear it asserted that OpenOffice produces um, you know, Word document format that is good enough but uh, so sometimes uh, academic publications have extremely strict standards. Is it your experience that uh, OpenOffice produces .doc files that, are, um, that they can't tell you're not using Microsoft Word and that they find acceptable for print publication? Um, in my experience, it's 95% likely to do so. And I admit that my, my laptop is dual boot and I check it in Microsoft Word first before sending it, if it's important. If it's something that's not very important, I, I don't bother. But if it is important or if it's complicated, because I still find sometimes that I open my Word document that was saved in OpenOffice in Microsoft Word, and the, the pictures have moved, or the formatting has gone a bit funny somewhere, or an equation hasn't come out, or something stupid like that. Okay. So it's close, but it's not quite there. Okay. Um, ditto shifting between uh, OpenOffice Impress and PowerPoint. It's the same, it's close, but in my experience, it's not quite there. I haven't tried OpenOffice 2. Okay. Um, that might be better, I don't yeah, know. Hopefully they've rectified some of those and, and yeah. people in the scientific community in particular can, yeah. we can get them involved in, in reporting bugs and, and and trying to resolve that. Sure. Of course, Microsoft will move the, you know, move the bar again, <laughs> their next release, but you know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, okay, and, and the, the last thing that I need is access to the specialist software that applies to my field. Um, and this is not necessarily going to be available for Linux. That's in fact the main reason why my um, computer is dual boot, in that I have to be able to write digital micrograph scripts. This is a scripting language that you use to talk to an electron microscope. Um, it's very broadly used in my field. Um, it's dead easy to write scripts in, but it's not available for Linux. So um, that ties me to using Windows at least some of the time, and I think that a lot of scientists are actually in that position. Um, and one of the, the implications of this is that I often want to be able to use software which is available for Linux and Windows so that when I'm stuck in Windows for a day because I'm doing mostly digital micrograph scripting, I can do the other stuff that I'm also doing in, um, in Windows as well. So, I mean, OpenOffice is good for that. I mean, obviously, like, LaTeX is fine as long as you've got a you know, reasonable editing environment on both sides and so on. In terms of the, the uh, broader features, broader um, things that I think scientists want or that I want. Um, I want stuff that just works. I would much rather be doing physics. It's more interesting than trying to figure out what on earth this thing is doing that's just died on me and why it's died and then writing a bug report and then having the, the maintainer of the package get back to me to say, I've got no idea what you're talking about. Can you please clarify? And then I try again and then, you know, 
I'd, I'd rather be doing science. Um, I want software which is easy to find. I spent, I don't know how many hours, ages really, tracking down different plotting programs, trying to find something that would plot um, a three-dimensional data set. Uh, and I tried, I don't know, lots of different things. Um, everything that I could find that was available in Debian, except for the ones that have really scary command line interfaces, because I don't like those. Um, I ended up packaging Labplot um, because there, there was nothing really good. But you know, this, this to me is the, the, um, the issue of having to hunt through so many different packages to find the one that actually works for you, to me, is, is a big hassle. Um, I would have rather have gone to a website and have someone say, yeah, you should use Labplot. Uh, you know, then I could do more physics. Um, I want software that I can hand to all of my colleagues, burn it onto a CD and say, look, you can use this. Say, look, no, you don't have to pay for a license. No, it's free. Give it to your students, all that. I think that's a, a massive um, advantage of uh, free software for uh, science. Um, and all right, as I was saying, I want software that's available for Windows. Um, I don't use a Mac, but some people would, but for Windows and Linux so that I can um, use it myself and so that I can obviously save something as a PowerPoint presentation and email it to my boss who doesn't have open office or <coughs> whatever. Um, that last line says anything else. I want to know what other people want. Uh, one thing. Hi. Okay. Uh, one thing that I've seen needed in like my meteorological environment at the, uh, of the moment is uh, small tutorials. Uh, people find the software and uh, maybe there's a huge manual, maybe there's a complicated command line interface, they have no idea if it does what it needs. Maybe if they find it useful, they'll read the whole manual, figure it out, do lots of stuff, but having like a two page, like do this, 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 and see the results just to have an idea of the whole philosophy is really important. It's usually done by peers. Like, do this, do that, oh, nice, oh, yeah, okay, oh, it does like this, yes, yeah, great. Uh, but it's rarely found on, on a piece of document. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, useful stuff for that would also be things like screenshots on web pages to say this is what you can produce with this piece of software. I, f I know I find those useful when I can find them. I'm into electronics, and there's a lot of software for electronics. Uh, in, in Debian and in Linux in general. And I feel that the, the thing that's missing is that it should be all integrated. Mm -hmm. in, if you want to do something, you have to take uh, parts from all different places. Like you have to use like 10 different packages and each package works differently, so you need to convert one format to the other, and, and it takes a lot of work because it's not integrated. I, I feel that in my, in my field, that's, that's the main lack. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be possible to coordinate um, the packages either at the Debian level or the, uh, communicate with the upstream um, developers of those packages to achieve greater integration? I think that the the problem is actually upstream. It, it's not at Debian level because they, they are so different that it's difficult to integrate it at Debian level. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we should talk to upstream and, and work on, on that direction. Sure. Is it mostly a problem with file formats? Uh, no, sort of. No, uh, th there are different things because uh, sometimes it's file format, sometimes it's uh, lack of data for a certain program. You need, like, for example, the definition of the components, uh, and one program has some components and the other has some other components, and that's tough. Yeah, fair enough. I guess wish, li um, wish list bugs might help, but I also think, as far as I can tell, with the very the little specialised things, it's often someone writing the thing that he or she needs for their own research. Um, and if they don't want to use the, the stuff that you want to use it with, then they don't have motivation to spend lots of their research time um, writing the component that does that. But, uh, yeah, maybe we can talk to people more about it. Also, there are some uh, programs missing in Debian, uh, such as programs uh, for clusters. Uh, 
which is, uh, for example, uh, QA systems similar to PBS. Uh, I, I, as far as I know, there are no such programs in Debian. There mm -hmm. is ITP, but uh, no packages. Okay. So, uh, also, we needed uh, a Globus toolkit. We tried to compile, compile it in Debian, but it uses uh, Java. It, uh, and we just failed to compile it, and we needed to install Red Hat. And uh, there was also a problem that some complex uh, programs uh, only have uh, RPM packages, and mm -hmm. uh, it is not a trivial thing to compile them for Debian. The one I'm aware of is a thing called ImageJ, which does image manipulations and um, calculations on the data. And it's, I've thought about packaging it a couple of times, but it's Java and I'm scared of it. Um, but that I would like to see in Debian. Uh, I'll just make a comment about the batch schedulers and then also grid middleware, like Globus Toolkit and stuff like that. Is that uh, typically on each different clusters, people have different, uh, have their own setups. So coming up with a package to fit all of these different sites would be quite difficult. And also, well, if, if you, you've probably installed PBS, it's sometimes just easier to install it and then forget about it. Um, then regarding the grid middleware uh, or grid software, people work, work on these things, but then when, uh, when they apply for funding to work on these things, they don't uh, consider uh, things like packaging. So you, you have people who are writing software, and then they package software, but they don't they package in it, it in a format which is, or they make a package that works, but not a package that is, uh, l let's say, nice. Running a few clusters on Debian, there is a packaging of uh, OpenPBS uh, Torque, uh, but it isn't in Debian proper, but there is a third party packaging for Debian. Also, you can find versions of Globus for Debian, just not the fr from the main site. A, a couple of the centers that do run Debian actually republish their packaging of uh, common cluster software under Debian as Deb packages. Um, I think one thing that would probably be really very, very nice indeed when it comes to scientific software, not just in Debian, but outside Debian, is if scientific, if scientific software were held to the same standards of quality as any other piece of software. Frankly, I've spent far too much of my life, firstly, trying to find out how this stuff is supposed to work at all. Secondly, trying to work out how they ever thought it could have worked, because it plainly can't possibly. And thirdly, the depressing thing seems to be that, on the whole, scientists can't write software. Yes. <laughs> and possibly shouldn't be allowed to write software a lot of the time. There's a um, lot of scientists with no formal training in, in software writing. And unfortunately, we end up with a huge pile of software, and people find it easier to rewrite rather than to try to get somebody else's software working. Um, possibly just forming a good pool of easily available scientific software would do something to alleviate that. If, mm. people could make, if people had some expectation that they could install a piece of scientific software and then modify it for their own needs, or just use it for their own needs, then they may be less inclined to spend months writing grant proposals and also spend years rewriting it. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a very sensible idea. Okay. So I, I sat down to write down what I think are the, um, the pros, the benefits for uh, using Debian for science research. And I mean, the first obvious one is that there are a lot of packages. If you want something, chances are there's already one of those in Debian. Um, and this, this is good. And Debian is, uh, you know, gets flack because it's supposed to be too difficult, but actually I think that most scientists or scientifically minded people can deal with the level of complexity of the, um, the Debian installer. Uh, and that, that's, that's, 
that's not a, an insurmountable problem for most people. Certainly in physics, most physicists, are, we're really geeks at heart. Um, I think that would be a bit different in um, some of the, the softer sciences, uh, psychology, for example. Um, there might not be so many people with the computer skills required to install and run Debian. Um, and one of the other benefits is that certainly some of the software um, available in Debian or Linux generally is better than that than what you can get for Windows or for Mac. Um, I'm all about KDevelop. I use that as my uh, development environment, and I think it's much better than the um, the environments I used in Windows in the years before I switched to Debian. There are other examples. Uh, Debian is cheap. Download costs really, or the cost of a CD. And this uh, really matters to students and also for um, people like me, an early career researcher, I don't have much funding. Um, when I have students, I need to provide software for them. There won't be much money to do that. So um, Debian is really good from that point of view. I'm not paying hundreds of dollars in, in licensing costs for some obscure piece of graphing software. Um, and also Debian is sticking around. It's not going to be gone in five years. Uh, so you know that you can start someone off on a PhD. They're going to be three or four years, maybe longer. Um, the software will still be around. Hopefully, it will still be maintained, <laughs> hopefully. Um, you know that uh, Microsoft is not going to stop supporting it. Um, so I think that there is a time investment involved in learning to use Debian if you haven't used it before, especially if you haven't used Linux before. But I think that that's going to pay off in the long run. Um, does anyone else have other, that was my list, does anyone else have other ideas of what the advantages are of using Debian for research? No? You're a boring lot. You mean there's nothing else good about it? Yeah? Uh, that Debian tends to have um, the installation tools a bit more advanced than others like FAI. And when you have to like reinstall all the labs or something like that, you can build mm -hmm. a bit larger infrastructure than that. And well, I work in a Fedora environment, and well, now they've been spending like three months to test the new Fedora Core 4 if it's going to be any decent or not. Okay. And then they will have to like install it machine by machine, spend like a month on it, and they're going to be quite hit by it. Uh, so yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that's right. That is an advantage. So the, the disadvantages I thought of, um, the first one is that there are a lot of packages and you can spend a long time fishing around for the one that is actually going to be useful for you. Um, and it can be sometimes very difficult to find, to get any sort of measure of the quality of any particular package in Debian. I think we need to give them stars or something. This is a five star piece of software and that's only a one star piece of software. So, you know. Um, and also it's true that some of the software in Debian, as far as I know, is actually not as good as the, um, the non-free alternatives. And the one that really springs to mind that I'm aware of is MATLAB. Um, as far as I know, Octave, yeah, are you going to disagree? I'm not expert, um, as, but uh, my impression is that, that Octave doesn't really compare. Go on, go on. Uh, could you please explain why you say that Octave doesn't really compare? I, I, I have to admit that I haven't used Octave, but I've asked people about it. Um, and that the last time I looked at the, the MATLAB development environment, which was MATLAB 6 or so, I was staggered by how much it had improved since I used it as a student. It's really, really easy. It's something that you can let a student with no programming experience loose on and they'll be able to work it out. Well, um, um, Octave is pretty stable, pretty freezed, but you have the Octave Forge part. The one that's developed in in SourceForge, mm -hmm. and they really work a lot to keep up with MATLAB new functions and everything. Okay. And at least as far as I've needed to use it, and I've used it quite a lot for different subjects at university, uh, it has never failed to do everything everything I needed to do for for my subject. Okay. Maybe in some specific field. It might not uh, fulfill the needs, but I really feel it's it's good enough. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I disagree. I use so everybody I work with in machine learning uses MATLAB, and I thought, well, fair enough. I'm going to switch to Octave. Um, there's very little support for sparse data matrices, 
And if you're working on huge, huge data sets with like several million features, you need to use the sparse matrix toolkit, which is there in which is there in MATLAB, but isn't there in Octave yet. Uh, people are supposed to be working on it, but in the year and a half that I've been looking at this, nothing has been done. There are various other functions that exist in MATLAB that I try to use that exist in MATLAB but don't exist in Octave. So, for instance, when somebody gives me a large MATLAB program that they've written, I can't run it in Octave. I can't run it in Octave without going back, editing it. Hopefully, stuff will actually be there in Octave, maybe having to rewrite functions that are built in in MATLAB. Um, Octave for many years was much slower than MATLAB. Uh, recently, it's been not so bad. You can do some really cunning stuff with Atlas and stuff like that to make it run faster. And then it does run very fast, but I've never succeeded in getting that to work. Like, I've put several hours into trying to compile the relevant stuff, and no. <laughs> I've used both the standard Octave stuff and Octave Forge, yeah. And I'm just, I find it incredibly frustrating because everybody I work with uses MATLAB and it just, the compatibility is not there and the speed is not there, the sparse matrix support isn't there, there are many other functions that just aren't there and maybe it's okay for some fields but certainly for machine learning it's not and that's a really big problem. Machine learning, so probabilistic modeling. Um, ba Bayesian probability, but for practical tasks, basically, yeah. So we need a lot of funny probability distributions. We need a lot of sparse matrices, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Did you want to say? Well, yeah. I mean, the the basic problem is just this: that there's the there are these big standard libraries of functions for machine learning, and the, most people just don't care or have never tested whether they work with Octave. Yeah. So it's maybe not that difficult to fix each individual bit of program to work, but you'll then end up spending your whole um, research time fixing other people's code, and they probably won't even want to take the changes back. So. Sure, sure. MATLAB is available for Linux, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so it's just a question of, of forking out for the license. Yeah, yeah I, I want to agree with the last opinion. I've been using MATLAB a lot in, in my investigation and so, and it doesn't reach lev the level we need. It, it lacks the Simulink. The, um, the libraries lack a lot, of, a lot of functions and work very differently, and uh, it doesn't reach the level. I, all the people I, I know that uses Linux at, at the university for, for this are using, mat, um, Linux, I, are using MATLAB for Linux, not Octave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe we really need to warn people that if, if their research is very dependent on MATLAB, they're going to have a problem with Octave before they waste weeks trying. great if there was a document around actually detailing the differences between MATLAB and Octave and saying which things aren't supported in Octave. Sure. But the problem is the people who actually have that knowledge are too busy publishing papers <laughs> to actually write such a document. Yep. So I, I think there is definitely a need for that, but I don't know anybody who has time to do it. Yep. Okay. So um, going on, for me, uh, I have problems in my research because I need to use proprietary software. Um, I spoke earlier about Digital Micrograph, which is only available for Windows and for Mac. Um, that's the small bane of my life. That means I need a dual-booting laptop. It's not the, not the end of the world. Uh, Cross-compiling my code so that my colleagues can run it on their Windows machines has been much more entertaining. Um, and I think I've gotten it beat now, but, but it was difficult. And I think that we could probably do better at Again, maybe producing, maybe I should write a how-to, um, producing documentation so that people who need to do this for their research, and I think it can't be that uncommon, um, can get some information about whether it's likely to be practical, whether it's likely to be um, you know, easy for them to do or if it's going to take weeks or whatever. Does anyone else here cross-compile? No? Am I the only person insane enough to, to agree to do that? All right, oh, well, well okay. So. <laughs> Scrap that. Um, another problem that, that I think is possibly more significant is that you go to your, um, the IT person in your department and say, oh, I'm running Debian, and they say, what? Um, actually, I was very impressed when I started at Monash recently that the IT guy was able to point me to a web page uh, which claimed to give instructions for setting up the email stuff in the, sy the email system for Linux. It didn't work, but <laughs> at least, at least um, there was something there. But actually, in practice, not all scientists want to uh, support their own systems. 
especially not their system and the system of the five students under them, which is likely to get broken because students mess around with computers. Well, yeah, you may not even be allowed to, even if, um, even if you'd like to. So this is a problem. I was just going to say, I mean, certainly in the department where I work, this is kind of interesting one because, I mean, there, Windows is unsupported as well, mm -hmm. but in the standard system is some kind of weird forked stuff from Red Hat. Um, but that means, again, in that, in that situation, people are actually less likely to want to go for a Debian system just because they've already got this mostly working system and even though people wisp, I mean, well, I don't know whether it's the, the problems with Red Hat or the problems with the stuff they've done to it, but people waste a huge amount of time um, comp with things that I know would work fine on a basic Debian system. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, yeah, if you're going to throw away the fact that it's supported, it's a lot. It's a big decision to actually yeah. bother doing that and running yeah. it yourself. Yeah. Of course, the other side of it is that universities tend to be fairly permissive about things, and you can quite often um, get away with doing whatever you want to do. Um, which you might not be able to do in a different uh, work environment. And uh, what other problems do people have? It occurred to me after watching Margot's talk about um, our users and are we, are we really prioritising them that internationalisation of software would be a problem for lots of researchers. Um, it's okay for me, but uh, probably other people, that's a worry. Anything else? I'm going to be boring again. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, where do we go with this? Um, one thing that I think would be. Yeah, the thing of Debian compared to Red Hat is that it's harder to make packages. Of course, in Red Hat, it's very easy to make crappy packages. But at least where I work, they can make Red Hat packages of the software they use and put uh -huh. them in some local app repository. They, there's in no way they may be able to do it with DEPS. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a case for um, Debian people to put their names on a list to volunteer time to will package your thing for you so that you can use it with Debian. Because if it, I mean, if it's simple, it's a, a trivial matter for many of us to create a working Debian package, which might be um, require hours of work for someone who doesn't have that experience. Maybe. So one of the things that uh, I thought would be of great use to um, people trying to decide to use Debian or people using Debian for research would be to have a list of the stuff that you really want installed so that you don't have to muck around comparing different, um, different packages that do roughly the same thing. So I wrote down the, the, um, the things that I use. Um, I use, the first thing I use is the development environment and I use kdevelop. Um, plus the compiler for whatever languages you're using. Um, I use Labplot to draw my graphs. Um, I use LaTeX and a GUI editor for it. Um, and I use OpenOffice. Beyond that, things that I might use in future include Octave, though maybe not based on what you people are saying. Um, and Python, I've been told, is, is very good for numerical analysis, and I, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> GNU R. Sorry? GNU, GNU R. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello. I've been using the GNU R for Sure. You were saying that um, GNU, is it R? No, R, OK. I'm not familiar with it. But OK. The web's. I, I don't. So the website me, is. Head on me once. So, uh, and it's, it's uh, coming with the Debian. OK, great. 
Okay. Yes, Brandon, I think we need a mic. I haven't used Lix. I think I might have looked at it once. Um, Kyle is an editor. Give it a go. Yeah. <laughs> I find it easy, but I'm, I'm um, heavily into GUI things. If I can press a button to say compile and run, I will, rather than having to type yeah, something so in. So well, that, that's Lix my take. Similar. Yeah. So I'll, I'll it now. It's, it's not WYSIWYG. Is, is Lix WYSIWYG? Uh, there is. Yes. Okay, Kyle is not. Kyle is, is you're actually writing. Well. Yeah. Um, Look, tell me what you think. <laughs> yeah, I'm installing it now. Sure. Do you know if there's a GNOME equivalent to KDevelop? I assume that there is, but I don't use GNOME. Can anyone answer Does that? Oh, okay. Is it is it good? What? What's the name of the? Anduta. Anduta. Okay. I haven't tried it. <laughs> I'd expect there'd be something as good as KDevelop, or you know, broadly similar. Okay. Anything else? Uh, can we have a small party for the final introduction of uh, Fortran 95 in Debian? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, there's that. I think, um, yeah, okay, that sort of comes up on my next page, uh, which is this question of how does Debian software compare with the alternatives? And I think we've already discussed Octave um, and MATLAB. And again, I haven't tried the uh, Debian Fortran 95, but I'm interested actually in switching back to using Fortran for my physics code um, because it has some real advantages that I'm sure lots of you would be aware of. So um, can anyone comment on the, uh, the new compiler? Is it, does it work? I mean, is it easy or am I going to spend hours or weeks getting it to work? Has anyone tried it? Yeah. Uh, it's, pretty, it's still pretty... Uh, it's still pretty raw. I don't use Fortran myself, but judging from the mailing list, it's, it's still pretty raw. There's, it's, it's very actively being developed upstream. Right. I think once GCC hits 4.1, it'll be a lot better. Okay, so I should uh, not leap into it right away. Well, don't like, you know, make your job depend on it. <laughs> okay. I think lack of Fortran is a, is a real problem. Um, has been, possibly, obviously still is a real problem for a, a lot of researchers. Certainly in physics, loads of people use Fortran. Um, that one is a problem. And again, for me, again, we talked about it briefly, um, the office suites or word processors that sometimes you're going to have to use to submit papers. Has anyone else got experience of major problems with uh, Debian packages for producing um, Word documents or PowerPoint presentations being the main ones? Um, open Office Calc? tends to kind of blow up when you try to connect it to databases to pull in data sets. Mm -hmm. I know I've had trouble with Excel spreadsheets, opening them in OpenOffice and they died because um, Excel isn't case sensitive and OpenOffice was, but is by default. Um, that's about the only trouble I've had with Calc. I was just going to say, I mean, in um, machine learning, the journals still tend to ask people to do stuff in LaTeX. Um, and then, so it's, in a way, it's easy for us there, and it's yeah. actually the, the Windows users, whoever, who end up having the problems. But on the other hand, if we want that situation to stay the same, rather than people all to switch to Microsoft Word, then we, as well, the free software community, needs to make sure that the facilities for writing, LaTeX, and so on, continue to improve. I mean, for example, the um, GUI editors, which I think, I mean, I think are kind of there, but it's still people end up having problems. I mean, again, even if you're just using LaTeX, even if people are happy writing raw LaTeX, mm. you can still have problems with things like ending up with PDF files with bad fonts in them and so on, and these, all these kinds of technical issues that really should be solvable. Yep, yep, I agree. Actually, speaking of PDF, I think OpenOffice is saved to PDF is one of the best things they've ever done, and that's one serious advantage it's got over Word, um, as far as I know. And uh, again, um, 
The other thing that I use is, is the plotting programs. I used Sigma Plot in Windows for several years. It's good. It's really it's a bit slow, but but it's good. Um, in my opinion, SciGraphica used to be better. Does anyone use SciGraphica now? I've had a lot of trouble with it in the last couple of years. As far as I know, it's not being maintained upstream, and it seems to have died, at least for me. Maybe it just hates me and my however the Python stuff is set up on my computer. But, um, and that was why I ended up packaging LabPlot, which is being very actively developed upstream, but it's still uh, lacking some of the features that SigmaPlot and SciGraphica had. Um, notably, I think, really easy rotating on the axes to get a look at your three-dimensional data from whatever direction you want, stuff like that. So I have hopes of LabPlot in the future that I think it will well overtake the uh, competition, but I don't think it has yet. Does anyone else um, know of good plotting programs that we should know about? GNU Plot. Uh -huh. Everybody I know uses GNU Plot. Um, I don't use it. I, I have it, trouble it may, with it. It may suck, but everybody uses it. Yeah. yeah. Um, people have a lot of respect for it, uh, even though it is apparently horrible. So it's probably worth at least looking into. I'm sure I did look at it um, yeah. because I've heard of it. And I went through everything I could find in Debian, but I must have had so much trouble that I've blanked it out because I don't remember <laughs> exactly why yeah, I didn't like yeah. it, but I didn't like it enough okay. to uh, So if you use track down Octave, plot. then all of the plotting stuff, so MATLAB has a plotting environment built in, whereas yep. Octave uses GNU plot. It okay. calls GNU plot. So all that's right. another Octave MATLAB difference. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. I mean, if Octave compares to MATLAB in its plotting abilities, then that's, that's a good possibility well, to use. Well, only kind of. Right. Because yeah. MATLAB's pretty good for plots. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello. Well, I used Poor++. Plus Plus. I don't know if it's uh, anything could be useful, but mm -hmm. it's quite powerful. Okay. It's available in, in Debian, so. Okay. I don't know it, actually. So, and the last thing um, is the question, yep, of making it easy for scientists to use Debian or to get the help they need with using Debian. I've wondered whether it would be worth setting up a mailing list, Debian Science, something, and, yeah. I was going to suggest turn the mic I was just going to suggest an, an idea which has just been pinging in my mind over and over again since your talk began is, this sounds like a great opportunity for a custom Debian distribution like Debian Med or Debian EDU. Mm. You know, have Debian Sci, or, you know, whatever a real scientist would want to call it. There's <laughs> something more clever. As, a, yeah. as, as an unlettered person, I, uh, I wouldn't presume to pick a name for the project. But uh, um, that's something I, I might personally be interested in getting involved in as kind of the uh, okay. Debian, D Debian experienced half. You know, as a person who can probably package something quickly, you, you know, you, you maintain the X window system for a few years, you learn the ins and outs of packaging, <laughs> at least up to a certain point. So. Uh, Anyway, that's, uh, I think that's something uh, that, that we should probably try to move on for, okay. uh, move on towards. There, you have not been the first person, uh, I believe, um, at, on Debian Day, which was a week ago Saturday, um, there was a talk given um, relating uh, the, uh, uh, actually it was Gunnar Wolf's talk, relating the scientific tradition to the principles of free software. Mm -hmm. It seems a very logical place to have a kind of marriage. Yep, so, absolutely. Um, Anyway, that's that, actually that a really good comment. idea. I hadn't thought of that. Um, I think that's a really interesting idea. We should talk about it. Um, well, that would go a little bit further than uh, making a wiki for people to write down their experiences. Um, but could be parts of it. yeah, I, I think it would be great if if people could search on you know Linux science software or something like that and come up with a page listing. Well, this is good and this is crap and this one's changing and you know and one that whatever. Well, of, of course, because Debian is the best distro. Anyway, don't <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, and the other thing that, that we can do as, as scientists is let our colleagues and our students um, know about Debian and say, hey, I've got this great piece of software that I'm using that I can use because it's Debian and I can just say, I get installed this and it's there and all its dependencies are there and you Windows people don't have a hope and you Red Hat people are going to be struggling for hours. Um, let people know why it's good. Um, I know there are some kind of Knopics-like live CDs for different kind of scientists. 
and maybe you can have a look at uh, the software se selection they used to, to give a um, free um, environment for this kind of scientists. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good idea. It would be great to be able to hand um, new students, here's your CD, you can just install this on your computer. Um, about CDDs, this seems one of the fields for simple CDD, which is a script that takes a package selection and a list of precedes and builds an DI image for it. Okay. And it'd be nice to expand it to make a um, uh, live CD. Yeah. And, well, the problem of making a CDD for science sounds like the problem of making a CDD for nonprofits. Science is really broad. Uh, I'm in the weather environment and Things are totally different than in physics, than in electronics, and so on. Sure. So you need to have a large variety of stuff, which you can do when you have a simple tool and you allow everyone to make their own one, and at least they would work 100% inside Debian. They would be motivated to package for Debian, having it inside, have it the BTS, and so on. Um, and that was my comment for CDDs. So I guess simple CDD is a good way to try, a good thing to try for that. Uh, get back to me about it. Okay. And um, about uh, other things that could help, uh, that tags has now really shitty support for science tags because I um, haven't been into the science world for long and mm -hmm. I'm no in no way expert and I could really use some help in finding out categories from mm -hmm. people who actually know science software inside Debian. If I try to have a look, I get lost between quantum physics things and things that I can't understand if it's math or physics because they refer some mathematical thing that I totally don't know and yeah. but that could be a nice effort because I, I'm pretty sure we could come out with like a lot of categories because we have a lot of software which will show that Debian actually contains a lot of useful stuff we yeah. are not used to think of. Yep, that's a great idea. I think that we're just about out of time. I think, um, well, we've done that bit, really. So if there are no more comments, I think. Last two. Uh, I have a small request for help. If anyone has worked with Starlink software, among other things, they contain possibly the best uh, library for binding Fortran and C together, which can do the bindings for any possible architecture. And uh, it's GPL software, and I can't get it into Debian because they are the packaging equivalent. They are British, and they, they are the packaging equivalent of driving on the left. There's no way to take their upstream tarball and turn it into something useful. And it's like, that's one major packaging problem I'd like to talk with others about. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking about an idea that, that was suggested before. And, it, and it's um, opening some kind of project in which um, scientists or develop <coughs> upstream developers who do, who do not have a clue on how to package for Debian would put their, um, their programs their, their, um, asking for help. I mean, I do have this program, I want this package, and, and everybody could, could have a look at it and say, well, I'm interested in this one. It would be nice to open such a project inside Debian. Mm. Yes, I agree, that, that'd be great. So I think that's the end. Thank you for uh, telling me what you think. Now I know more than I did.